And now mostly lost uh, series of adaptations of, of Conan Doyle stories for the BBC in 1967. And it ended with uh, Hawksworth trying to adapt one of the Conan Doyle ghost stories, The Brown Hand, for a proposed anthology series in the late 80s. Uh, but there were other moments along the way. And what I'm going to do today is run through the key moments in that relationship and especially talk about that missing 1967 series, because it's what convinced Hawksworth to make a go of a career in television in the first place. And he had quite an incredible career, becoming one of the most successful producers and dramatists in British television. And I'm sure some of these programmes will be familiar to you. Um, probably the most famous is Upstairs Downstairs, which was a huge commercial hit. Um, but after that, he moved to the BBC, where he produced another turn of the century drama, the Duchess of Duke Street, which is, I think, quite possibly his, his best TV show. But there were also other hits along the way, like Danger UXB, which was a hard-hitting serial about a bomb disposal squad, which actually drew on his experience in the Second World War. And there was a, a rather wonderful adaptation of the Marjorie Allingham Campion novels uh, in the 80s, starring, starring Peter Davison. Um, but that stellar career, TV career actually kicked off with this Arthur Conan Doyle series made in 1967. And it is called simply Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. It consisted of 13 50 minute adaptations of non Sherlock Holmes stories, of which 12 were scripted by Hawksworth. And it's important for three reasons. Firstly, it was Hawksworth's first gig as a lead writer of a series. Secondly, it earned him his first television award. And thirdly, it was the reason why Michael Cox contacted Hawksworth to help him with the Granada series. So if you look at the uh, study in celluloid, this is what Michael Cox has to say, that Hawksworth's first triumph was a modest series for BBC Two in the late 60s. And this was based on some of Conan Doyle's non-Sherlock Holmes stories, those about the supernatural and medical life, ingeniously reworked for a group of running characters. And the series that Cox remembered so fondly is, I think, a bit of a hidden gem and offers us some insights into the creative process that Horsewood would bring to the Granada series. And I think it's a brilliant template for really what could be done today as well. So first of all, a bit on, on Hawksworth. He was born in 1920, studied history at Oxford before joining the Grenadier Guards and fighting in the last years of the Second World War. Uh, he described his military experience as 80% boredom, 20% bang. Um, when he was demobbed, he found himself out of work like thousands of others, uh, but he had a real talent as an artist. And through a speculative exhibition of his own artwork, uh, he was spotted by the chap on the left, Vincent Corder, the great film art director, who'd won an Oscar for his work on The Thief of Baghdad in 1940. Uh, and Corder saw in Hawksworth a great natural talent and signed him up as an assistant draftsman um, uh, at his studios in Shepparton. And this became a five-year apprenticeship, <coughs> uh, which gave Hawksworth an overview of all aspects of production, not just art direction. Uh, probably the most famous film he's art director on is The Third Man, which is a terrific film um, and looks beautiful even to this day. Uh, but he was also loaned out to other to directors like David Lean, uh, and David Lean liked working with Hawksworth so much that he offered him the role of art director. Um, and Hawksworth turned it down. But had he not turned it down, his name would have been on the Bridge on the River Kwai, Lawrence of Arabia and Dr. Zhivago. Uh, 
So clearly Hawksworth was regarded well for his art direction. Um, but after his apprenticeship, Hawksworth moved from art direction into film production. And his great success came in 1953 with a film uh, called Tiger Bay about a young girl who witnesses a crime of passion and then forms an unlikely bond with the criminal. Uh, the, the girl was played by Hayley Mills, um, who went on to great television success. This was her first film role. And the detective in that film was played by John Mills, her father. Um, it was a really great critical success. Hayley Mills won the BAFTA for Best Newcomer. But critically, Hawksworth also was BAFTA nominated for the script, uh, which was really impressive, considering he was he was actually producer on this. And he had commissioned a professional scriptwriter, received the script, thought that's rubbish, decided he was going to write it himself um, at the last minute. Uh, and though um, uh, it was all very time pressured, he got this BAFTA nomination. So through Tiger Bay, he discovered that he had a knack for script writing. And it was that that was you know, validated immediately by the BAFTAs. But the late 50s was a really difficult time in British television industry, with TV audiences being drawn away from the cinema uh, to the home with TV for, uh, for TV, and American films were flooding the cinema screens. So Hawksworth moved into TV commercials and then writing into one-off scripts for television dramas. And he really cut his teeth in commercial television. So at the time in the UK, uh, this is about 1961. Um, there were only two channels. There was BBC and ITV. And ITV was a network of commercial channels. Uh, Hawksworth wrote primarily for the commercial channels and really got to grips with this kind of one hour, three act format, which you will all be familiar with. Um, but, you know, particularly as the, the, the mainstay of the Granada series as well. Um, and you can see that discipline really served him well. So in 63, he then hit on the idea while he was a jobbing scriptwriter on these one-off gigs, he hit on the idea of adapting some of Conan Doyle's stories. Um, and how this happened, we don't quite know, but we do know that he had a copy of the book on the left, the John Murray Omnibus edition, and he devoured the lot, which is no mean feat because it's 1,200 pages. Um, and uh, uh, he saw the immense potential in the range of stories and contacted the Conan Doyle estate for the rights. Now, this was at the time that Adrian Conan Doyle had set up um, Sir Nigel Films with uh, an agent called Henry E. Lester. And it was, to put it mildly, a bit of a dodge in the sense that actually the, the estate owned the rights, but Sir Nigel was was leasing um, leasing against them. And Horsworth managed to strike a deal with Sir Nigel Films, which would cover um, the rights to produce television series based on any of the stories in the Conan Doyle stories book, with the exception of two Gerard tales, uh, and also um, a, a couple of others as well. Uh, the two Gerard tales were reserved because um, the estate already had plans, which was for the, the rather terrible film, The Adventures of Gerard, uh, nicknamed Carry On Gerard. Um, and uh, uh, Hawksworth actually got really lucky with this because he signed the deal with Sir Nigel just before a, uh, Dennis's widow, Nina, put an injunction on Sir Nigel films. So had he been three months later, um, there's the high likelihood that he actually would never have got the rights to the series, uh, to these stories at all, and wouldn't have been able to uh, to adapt them. So he had the permission from the estate, and he decided now to go hawking around the TV idea to the various stations and channels. Uh, and he started to write his pitch. And his idea was to do straight adaptations of 13 or 26 stories in the first instance. And in picking them, he wanted to reflect the range and variety of Conan Doyle's work. So alongside Gothic classics like um, Lot 249, the, the Egyptian mummy story, there were comic tales like the body swap story, the great Kineplatz experiment, uh, the sporting tales like the boxing tale, um, the Croxley master. But he also became really interested in Conan Doyle as a, as a person and the semi-autobiographical nature of the stories like Crab's Practice, which is about um, a young doctor setting up in uh, setting up in practice and struggling to get patients, or the Three Correspondents, which is uh, about a war reporter and draws on Conan Doyle's experiences as well. And there was even a suggestion, very briefly, that Conan Doyle might appear in the stories as a linking narrator or possibly even a character. Um, Hawksworth had the idea that he might be uh, Conan Doyle might be portrayed in his study introducing the tales, holding an object of relevance uh, to the story, a bit kind of Alfred Hitchcock's presents as we would come to see it. 
Um, but in the end, those ideas weren't pursued. So with the estate on side and a pitch, he started to go to the networks and the production companies. And he went to the BBC, who knocked him back immediately. So he then went around all the ITV networks. And, and this went on for three years. So between 63 and 66, he was involved in conversations that went absolutely nowhere. And all the time, the Conan Doyle estate was getting more and more stroppy, as you can tell from Henry Lester's uh, uh, letter there. And it all looked like it might fizzle. Uh, until one day the BBC, um, Hawksworth went to the BBC again through a friend and this time got an introduction to the right person. And that right person was the chap on the left here, Gerald Savory, head of serials. So at the time, the BBC had a drama group and it was made up of several departments. And the head of the drama group was Sidney Newman, a Canadian who had moved to the IT to ITV and then to the BBC. And he's best remembered now as the co-creator of Doctor Who. Um, but it was under Newman... <clears throat> that uh, uh, there was Gerald Savory. And Sar Savory had been a, a script writer and script editor at ITV, at some of the franchises, and had produced adaptations of Dickens and Maupassant and Saki and Austin, uh, a lot of them with Granada, actually. And he was a brilliant script writer in his own right. He would go on to script uh, the 1977 BBC adaptation of Dracula called Count Dracula, which stars Louis Jourdain um, and is, you know, beloved of Dracula fans because it's probably the most accurate uh, or more, most faithful to the book. Um, so Savory and Hawksworth met over lunch and Savory made a couple of really important suggestions that influenced Hawksworth thinking. To that point, Hawksworth had really pitched a series of very disconnected stories from different time periods. In fact, his early list had included stories going from ancient Rome to the present day. Um, so Savory suggested that instead, Hawksworth pick a few years and then create uh, a group of running characters who would be interspersed into each of these and would essentially appear across the story. So he'd create a kind of consistent Doyle universe, a Doyleverse um, that these characters would inhabit. And it's a nice idea. You see this today with all manner of things. And, um, uh, you know, Conan Doyle's just another example of where this this indeed could be done. Um, so uh, Hawksworth really picked up on the idea, uh, went away for some holiday, read all the stories again, and then picked three characters that he was going to use to link the stories. So the idea being that they would all be friends at university in Oxford and then they would we would follow them through their lives. And the three characters he settled on were these three. So Philip Hardacre is a sporty medical student and a sort of Victorian adventurer type, but he comes from a poor background. And so a lot of his story is, is about him struggling to make, pay his way. Uh, in contrast, Tom Crabbe is another medical student, but a much more playful and comic type. Uh, he actually has a developing interest in psychic research uh, and writes on the subject and sets up in practice uh, gets married and becomes a pillar of the community. Uh, and the third, William Monkhouse Lee, is a student of archaeology who is quieter than the others, more impressionable, uh, comes from a well-to-do family of industrialists, but would prefer to study rather than take part in the family business. And his research takes him across the world, including to Rome in one of the stories. And you'll spot that the three, story, the three characters all come from different stories, from The Beetle Hunter, from Crab's Practice, and from lot number 249. So Savory absolutely loved the treatment and he greenlit the project, but there remained the problem of a producer. So Hawksworth had originally pitched the idea saying, I'd like to be a producer. But in the 60s, the BBC didn't use independent producers. They had staff producers. Uh, and uh, Hawksworth was, I think, quite relieved when the BBC, when Savory appointed a chap called Harry Moore uh, uh, to be the producer. Now, Harry Moore had been an American actor. He trained at the actor's studio and he'd moved to the BBC in the, in the 50s and moved into production. Um, but he produced this series on the left called 30 Minute Theatre, which was a very adventurous series. And it gave a lot of new writers and directors their first their first gigs, really. Um, so people like Dennis Potter, the great British playwright, um, he actually got his first commission was for, uh, TV commission was for 30 Minute Theatre. Uh, and directors like Piers Haggard, who's familiar, who's famous for lots of sort of folk horror and things like Blood on Satan's Floor and um, Quatermass uh, and things like that. He got his first um, directing gig with 30 Minute Theatre and with Harry Moore. And Moore was an absolute bundle of energy. What he did is that he started on the Monday and by Friday of that week, he and Hawksworth had written a blueprint for the series. 
So he went through all of the stories. They pretty much settled on 12 of the 13. They decided on the linking thread. They revised the character descriptions. They worked out how many episodes would need location filming, and they submitted a draft budget. So it's pretty good work for five days, I think. Um, but what's amazing is that that five that that five day piece of work is really similar to what actually um, went on screen uh, about six months later. So as Hawksworth and Moore filtered the stories, they developed all the linking narratives. And so this is the thirteen episodes and what happens to each of the story the, the characters. They all meet in the first one, lot number two four nine, which is a, um, a story set in Oxford where uh, a, a, a mysterious a uh, student called Edward Bellingham has decided that he's going to take revenge on his uh, fellow students and those who have annoyed him by resurrecting an Egyptian mummy. Um, and it's a brilliant story. It's a, it, And Hawksworth never considered another one for the first episode. It was always going to be lot number 249. But then in terms of the linking narrative, what happens to Philip is he he would um, struggle to pay his fees between second and final year. So he he takes a, an apprentice doctor's job uh, and that gets him involved in a prize fight in the Croxley Master. Um, he then takes a break from his studies uh, to go on holiday in Wales uh, in, um, and meets a mysterious and beautiful woman. That's in the mystery of Kada Ivan, which is actually an adaptation of the surgeon of Gastafel. They changed the name uh, for reasons I'll come back to. Um, and then at the end, he takes another lucrative commission out of financial necessity in The Beetle Hunter. Um, Tom Crabb uh, falls in love with a girl called Vicky and have a near-death experience in the Eiffel Tower lift. Um, it's not the Eiffel Tower in the story, uh, but they had to change it at the last minute. Um, uh, he then, uh, after their marriage, they set up in practice, uh, but find it difficult to get uh, patience, which is the Crabb's practice. Then um, he... Ex indulges his interest in psychic research with his uncle um, in the Brown Hand before he serves as a police surgeon in Red Handed, which is a version of Conan Doyle's um, The Story of B24. And then Monkhouse Lee would become uh, would stay at university a bit longer than the others. He and um, Tom Crabb would appear in The Chemistry of Love, which is an adaptation of a story called uh, A Physiologist's Wife. Um, and after his university days, he'd take a temporary tutoring job uh, at a at a peculiar school in the Willow House School, and then he would be excavating Roman artifacts in the new catacomb before he and Tom and uh, and another character all come back together again for the final story, which is playing with fire, which is all based around a seance. Um, but there's another fourth character started to appear in the course of Hawksworth and Moore working together, and that was the character of Tom's wife, Vicky, um, Vicky Crabb. And uh, though she's a minor player in very early drafts, Hawksworth clearly warmed to the character and decided to, to build her part as she came, as she walked through. Partly this might actually be because of um, the uh, performance of the actress, Michelle Detrice, who went on to lots of, lots of great things uh, and is still working on the stage today. Um, Hawksworth showed a great understanding of the dramatic potential of these characters. And one of the things he's, no he's well known for is the fact that he writes really great ensemble pieces. If you watch Upstairs, Downstairs, it's the, the, the best scenes are the ones where you've got four or five main characters in the room. Um, and, and he does that really, really well. Um, the weird thing is that they got through all this pre-production, they had the scripts, they had the casting, uh, they were ready to go into full, um, uh, they'd actually got the first few episodes ready. It was about to broad broadcast and it still didn't have a title. So the series actually, um, went by lots of different titles at different times. It was the Conan Doyle Theatre, then it was Stories of Conan Doyle, then it was Conan Doyle Mystery and Adventure, um, and eventually the producer decided it was going to be called Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, but this was actually too late for the TV listings. So somewhat bizarrely, the series didn't have a series title for the first two episodes, um, and it means that it, 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 it's resulted in endless confusion to this day. So if you go to the BBC archives or the British Film Institute, it will still you'll still find the, the series called different things, um, often the short stories of Arthur Conan Doyle, which actually is a better title because um, so Arthur Conan Doyle sounds like it's a biopic. Um, but, you know, that's that was actually the title they, they settled on. So only one episode actually exists of the 13 
parts, and uh, that's the one based on Gastafell. But we can piece together something of the shape of the series from the surviving scripts, and also Hawksworth papers. I managed to get access to all of Hawksworth's personal papers, and he has boxes and boxes and boxes about this series, but also Granada, as I'll come back to as well. Um, and that's the next project. Um, so what can we make of the series? I'm not going to go through each of them in turn. I'll just highlight some of the themes. But the first thing that leaps out is camaraderie between the main characters. And um, it's really more than a gimmick. They they really do form as a uh, as three um, friends in Oxford. And you pick that up later in Crab's practice where they all come together to help Tom. Um, you can see on that top left hand picture, this is the moment when Philip Hardacre is having to pretend that um, he's drowned so that Tom can miraculously bring him back to life with the power of a galvanic battery um, for the purposes of uh, uh, of wowing the locals and actually getting new business. Um, and it's a straight up farce, um, but it's it's great. And what, what works really well is the really zingy dialogue. And there are some really good laugh out loud moments, uh, in, including some great sort of moments of high farce. Um, what's amazing is that almost all the dialogue is exactly the same as the Conan Doyle short story, which shows that, you know, in 80 years, that humor and that, um, uh, and that's, and that storytelling could still carry on, uh, you know, would still relevant after all that time. Um, I mentioned before that the surgeon of Gastafel got renamed the mystery of Kadarivan. And that was because um, the BBC planned to film in uh, Yorkshire, where Gastafell is set. It's actually set around Mason Gill, where his mother um, moved in her later years um, to the estate of Brian Charles Waller. And it was actually around there that Conan Doyle got married to his first wife. Um, but the BBC weather, weather report said it was going to snow that week. Um, it was the wrong type of snow again. And so what happened was they had to relocate it. And they relocated it to Wales. Um, Hawksworth knew of a valley uh, which was actually he he'd filmed in as an art director and said, oh, well, this is great. They checked the weather forecast and said, yeah, that's good. So he had to completely rewrite the script. But the reason for flagging this is because um, it, it shows that he was sort of flexible with the stories and could still remain pretty true to them uh, as well. So the story is a is a compression of Gastafel, but <clears throat> it works really well. And the eagle eyed among you will spot the character on the right hand side there. Um, who in this series, in this story is called Julia Lambert, is played by Charlotte Rampley. Um, and this is actually her first or second TV role. Um, and that's perhaps why this is the only episode that survives in the BBC archive, um, because she does she does impress. I've seen the episode. She does impress. She's very good. Um, but there are other great, great moments of casting as well. And probably the best for that is um, the Chemistry of Love, the third episode based on a physiologist's wife, which is about a hardened scientist called Ainsley Gray, who can only rationalise love as a chemical process. And then he falls head over heels in love with a beautiful, intelligent widow called Janetta O. James. And it, this is probably one of the best scripts of the series, um, because Horsworth takes what is actually quite a clunky short story by Conan Doyle, and it's got a really obvious twist. And he completely reinvents it. He, he adds a, a completely new first half. So the short story begins with Ainsley Gray turning up to, at his sisters and saying, I'm about to get married. So you don't see anything of the build of the relationship. Whereas Hawksworth adds an entire first half to the story, which has this has Gray progressively falling in love. And the two actors that they picked were Michael Horden and Billy Whitelaw, um, you know, a, a good decade or more before she terrified everybody in The Omen. Um, so um, uh, this is a brilliant casting. It showed that they could get really top flight names to to appear. Um, another story that got a really major refit was The New Catacomb, which features Monkhouse Lee. And this is an example of how it was, Hawksworth was creating a bit of a problem for himself as well in creating recurring characters because the original story set in Rome, it's about two rival archaeologists, Berger and Danvers. Berger has found a new catacomb and won't share the location. Uh, with Danvers, his rival, unless Danvers tells him an equally valuable secret. And Dal Danvers tells him how he seduced an innocent young woman whose reputation he's now ruined. Um, they then go to the catacomb and Berger leaves Danvers to die there, revealing that, in fact, he is the fiancé of the woman that Danvers has wronged. So that's brilliant. It's a great story. It consists of two scenes. The problem with it is that if you make 
Monkhouse Lee, the, the, the burger character, you're essentially making one of your main characters a murderer. And so that was going to be a bit of a problem for Hawksworth for the rest of the series. So he actually does something really quite clever. And this is where he has the biggest breach with Conan Doyle, uh, or one of the biggest breaches, really, in that he has um, it all plays out of the story. And then Lee changes his mind and he goes back into the catacomb to find Danvers, rescues Danvers, who's actually borderline insane at this point. Um, and uh, uh, finds Danvers alive uh, and then um, Danvers blackmails him into giving over complete control of the catacomb to him. So Lee not only loses his fiance, who in this actually commits suicide, it's much darker, um, <clears throat> but also he loses this, this amazing catacomb. But um, what is interesting is that because Lee loses his fiance in this, um, that's why he goes to the seance in the last episode, because um, it actually in this series, uh, events and actions have consequences. So playing with fire suddenly has more weight, more emotional weight, because one of the regulars has lost his his fiance in an earlier episode. Um, another one that gets a lot of reworking is the story of B24, which uh, is about a burglar who is falsely accused of murder uh, of murder. And the story is told entirely as a kind of the 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 burglar's plea to an to an to the audience. Um, but in this. Hawksworth turned it into a courtroom drama so that he could show the different versions of the events being told. Um, but he also came up with a different ending um, when it's dramatically revealed in this story that um, the burglar couldn't have wielded the knife because he actually has a withered right hand. So Lady Mannering, who is actually the murderer, is sort of saying he went like this with the knife. And he says, yeah, well, I couldn't do that because I don't have I don't I, I have a withered right hand. It's brilliant on paper. Um, it makes absolutely no sense in the story for the simple reason that in the first scene, Bates is arrested and handcuffed. And you would have thought somebody would have spotted <laughs> that the handcuff was, was you know, falling off one of the hands. But we'll leave that to artistic interpretation. Um, years later, Hawksworth admitted, uh, quote, the withered hand was my idea. I hope C.D. Conan Doyle didn't mind. Um, but he also gave it the very, you know, tongue-in-cheek title, uh, red-handed, which works which works a number of ways. Um, but more often than not, there are very, very few fundamental changes to the stories. And I think this tells you how visual and compelling and, and modern a storyteller Conan Doyle was. So the brown hand gets a slight tweak in terms of characters. Um, the beetle hunter plays out over a, a slightly longer time period than the story, but is essentially the same. And the Croxley master is virtually word for word the story. I mean, they, he changes one thing. He changes um, one moment in the fight, which actually adds to the tension. It's a good addition. Um, but otherwise, um, it's the same story. And um, it, it's also the case that Hawksworth lifted the prose from the stories and put it into the set descriptions and the scene descriptions in the rehearsal scripts. It's not all great news. There are two scripts that are particularly weak. The first is The Will at House School, which is actually an adaptation of The Latin Tutor. And it was written by the producer, Harry Moore. Now, sadly, Harry Moore might have been a good actor and a producer, but he wasn't a good script writer. And it's a really overly complica complicated story. He takes a story which isn't very strong in the first instance and then makes it so you know slightly more more convoluted and the other one is the black doctor which is scripted by hawksworth it was the last one for him to script it wasn't the last episode of the series but it was the last one he scripted um and it's not a great conan Doyle story itself um and uh, uh it, it doesn't really rise above it he does inject into it a kind of athelney jones idiot police inspector um to try and keep the story moving but it it doesn't quite work um <clears throat> But those two cases aside, the series made, I think, a great deal of good of the, the source material and probably never more so than in the final episode, Playing With Fire, which is about a seance that goes wrong. And Hawksworth wanted to present the subject of spiritualism with due deference to Conan Doyle's personal beliefs, which I think is a is a nice touch. And it shows that kind of relationship he he felt he had with the author. Um And he wanted to do that while also presenting the skeptics view. So what he did was that he creates a new first half to the story. And the first half of the story has a psychic researcher working with Tom Crabbe unmask 
a fraudulent medium. Um, and this is great because it nicely wrong foots the audience for the second half where there is a seance which actually um, is genuine. And in fact, it turns out that Vicky has mediumistic powers and that's how the second the second seance works. Um, but that was the last episode to be broadcast. 11 of the 13 got repeat runs on BBC One uh, in 1968 uh, and then they were never seen again. And in the mid early mid eight, uh, 70s the series became one of many victims of bbc junking of videotapes um so series like doctor who dad's army had hancock's half hour step to and son are all missing episodes to this day and um unfortunately the chances of recovering this series are really infinitesimally small i would say the reason being and we can point our finger a bit to the current kind of toilet state on this one is that what happened was that the the series was never exported. Um, a lot of those series that have been recovered in the past have come from foreign broadcasters. Um, in fact, a lot of Doctor Who in colour, um, the early Doctor Who colour stories came from Australian broadcasters because they'd kept the videotapes and the BBC hadn't. Um, but the series was never exported for the very good reason that the Conan Doyle estate said they wanted to keep the rights to sell in the USA, which they were unable to do. And so the BBC felt it wasn't worth their time promoting it to other territories outside the UK. In fact, they made that decision um, before the second episode was broadcast. So right from the beginning, um, uh, it doesn't exist. In fact, I thought there was only one possible location it could be, and I just had it confirmed that it's not there this week, <laughs> which is I thought it might have been in Castle Lucians in, um, in Switzerland because Adrian wrote a stroppy letter to the BBC saying he didn't like the first episode. And um, and I thought, well, how did he see that if he was in Switzerland? And maybe somebody had sent him a copy. Um, but unfortunately, he was probably in the UK at the time and saw it on on broadcast. Um, but this was the only the first of Hawksworth associations with Conan Doyle. And the whole um, 1967 series had a coda of sorts in that Hawksworth and one of the lead directors, Richard Martin, and the producer, Harry Moore, got together literally a few weeks later after the first series, after the 67 series had finished uh, filming, to work on a, um, a series called Late Night Horror. And Late Night Horror um, was uh, the first BBC series to be made and transmitted in colour. It was actually made in 67, it was broadcast in 68, uh, and it consisted of six half-hour episodes. Some say it was meant to be longer than that, but it was so shocking and gruesome that it got cancelled. I think it's more likely it was only ever really intended to be six episodes. And um, uh, the episode, the last of the six was an episode called The Kiss of Blood, which is an adaptation of um, The Case of Lady Sannox, uh, which is probably one of the most shocking stories Conan Doyle ever wrote. Um, and the uh, the adaptation starred Roy Detrice, who was Michelle Detrice's father, and Diane Salento, who at the time was... Uh, the um, wife of Sean Connery. And um, Hawksworth stays reasonably close to, to Conan Doyle's original, but tweaks the twist of the ending. Um, and uh, uh, the, there's a very infamous ending to this story where a woman is mutilated. And this was apparently done with full blood and gore, which, you know, if you imagine 1968 BBC, people tuning in at 11.30 p.m. on a night with for the first grainy sort of colour images, Apparently, it was pretty horrible, and um, the audience reports sort of suggest that's the case. Um, but unfortunately, this series two was junked in the 1970s. There's only one episode exists, and it isn't the Hawksworth one. Um, another notable excursion, though, was Challenger. And Hawksworth had expressed an interest in Challenger from the very beginning when he auctioned the stories. Uh, in fact, in his first agreement with the estate in 63, he had the rights to When the World Screamed, one of the later short stories. Um, he couldn't get The Lost World because that was still under 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 rights at the time. Uh, but in 79, he acquired the rights to the character again to develop a pitch for a Challenger series. And this time, Hawksworth had an eye on the American market. So in this treatment, uh, Challenger was an American by birth who'd moved to the UK with his niece, uh, who was also serving as his secretary. And it was otherwise quite faithful with the cast, including Malone and Roxton and Summerlee and Austin, uh, who is a challenger's chauffeur and, and sort of um, odd job. Um, 
the Hawksworth then sort of came up with uh, six types of stories for Challenger. And they all range from kind of lost world type discovery tales to scientific cataclysms like you get in the, the poison belt. And they closely more mirrored those kind of five Challenger stories. But he added a sixth, which was one where Challenger faces an ethical dilemma, which I guess today feels a bit more contemporary than, uh, than perhaps it might have done so much in, in, in 79. But it, it has a very strongly anti-capitalist strand, which you can read in into when the world screamed as well. Um, and Hawksworth went so far as to write the first, to script the first episode of this series, which was an adaptation of The Poison Belt, a 60 minute adaptation of The Poison Belt. Um, the first act was essentially the first meeting between Challenger and Malone. The second was the introduction of the regulars and the poisoning of the planet. And the third was uh, Challenger and his team exploring the dead world and then the resolution. It's unfortunately not a great script. Um, there's not enough action, there's not enough uh, uh, made of the resolution, which actually is a kind of pivotal moment for mankind. It's much more throwaway. Um, and perhaps for that, it doesn't get picked up. But the dialogue between the regulars is absolutely brilliant. It's another example of that great um, sort of uh, camaraderie he creates. Uh, but it didn't get recycled because in 82, there was a series called QED, um, which came out um, on CBS in the US. And that starred Sam Waterson as Quentin E. Deverill, QED, a brilliant but irascible Harvard scientist who journeys to England at the turn of the century and gets involved in a series of loosely scientific adventures. Um, there are a few changes to the characters, but essentially it's the same pitch uh, with the inclusion of a Moriarty-like villain called Dr. Stephen Kilkis, who's played by Julian Glover. Um, CBS loved it. Audiences didn't. Uh, it's a pastiche, um, but it really doesn't signal the tone terribly well. Uh, and the network audiences switched off. And Hawksworth returned to the UK, um, very pleased with the amount of money he'd made and not so pleased with the, uh, the fate of the series. Uh, if you go on YouTube, you can actually see the whole thing. Um, it's, it's worth it, but you probably want to have a drink with you to get through an episode or two. Um, but of course, the biggest connection and reconnection with Conan Doyle would be the Granada series. And there's rightly been, I think, a lot of focus on Michael Cox, but I think this has partly served to underplay Hawksworth's major role in the series. Uh, when it comes to developing for television, Hawksworth made a lot of pivotal changes. Um, and to begin with, he went through every single story. He uh, noted characters, locations, strengths and weaknesses for adaptation. He even put together his own chronology of the, of the, of the series. Uh, which became one of the sources for the famous series Bible. Uh, and he also wrote the first script, of course, The Sign of the Four, which uh, wasn't produced until later, but it was the first script to be drafted. And Michael Cox circulated that script to all the prospective writers to be, give an indication of, of how the series should be done. Um, and the production correspondence between Cox and Hawksworth survives. Uh, and I've now got access to um, some of the uh, production files are in Granada, which are just being released again now after being sort of lost for 20 years. Um, and you can start to see how Cox relies on Hawksworth as the arbiter of tone for the series. Um, but Hawksworth's letters also explain away a few mysteries. So he and Cox disagreed on how the series should open. Uh, Cox originally wanted to begin with a study in Scarlet, and Hawksworth was really very negative about the story. Um, and he actually said in a letter to Cox that it really is a pretty badly constructed and badly written story. And the American part is sketchy and unwieldy and unconvincing. <laughs> so <laughs> pretty much damning. Um, but he also thought that actually the first meeting of Holmes and Watson is pretty unmemorable in his words. Um, and Graham Greene said exactly the same thing as well. Um, so when Cox came back to Hawksworth and said, OK, well, let's not do study in scholar. Let's maybe tack on the laboratory scene at Bart's to the beginning of one of the regular episodes. Um, Hawksworth said, no, don't like that idea either. And so that got ditched. Um, and there might seem like minor changes, but I think one of the great features of Granada is that we jump into the series with the relationship already formed. The audience doesn't need to know how Holmes and Watson get together. They're already there as a package right from the beginning. And I think that means that you, you don't really need an origin story. It works really well. Um, 
Hawksworth then commissioned all the first and second series scripts and was effectively the first pass script editor. Uh, he actually came up with an A and B list of writers that he wanted to invite to the series. Um, on the A list, there were um, there was uh, John Mortimer, the author of the Rumpole of the Bailey series. And there was also our old friend Gerald Savory, who'd influenced him so much in 67. Um, unfortunately, neither of them eventually contributed a script. But he also pushed for certain stories to be included. Um, uh, two of them that weren't really going to be in the first series at, uh, in the series at all were um, quite astonishingly uh, the Musgrave Ritual uh, and the Blue Carbuncle. They couldn't decide how to do the Musgrave Ritual. At one point, they were talking about whether they should try to de-age um, before the de-aging technology, try to de-age Brett or even have somebody else play Sherlock Holmes. It was a very odd um, set of discussions. Um, but um, they came to the right conclusion, I think, in the end. But Blue Carbuncle is interesting because there's always been the mystery about the author, Paul Finney, which is you know, well known to be a pseudonym. Um, but actually going into the Hawksworth letter shows that Hawksworth originally commissioned Richard Harris, who had written the Cushing series adaptation of Black Peter. Um, and and uh, Harris submitted the script. Hawksworth read it and thought it was rubbish. Um, he uh, what happened was that Harris actually didn't like the original story he'd been given. He thought it was very weak uh, and that it needed a lot of embellishment. And that's what he'd done. He'd embellished it enormously. Hawksworth wrote a letter to Harris, which basically has a lot of amendments, but also a timeline of events. <laughs> he basically says it has to happen in this order. Um, and um, uh, and there was clearly some disagreement. Uh, and eventually Harris had his name taken off. Um, but if you look at that final script and you, you know, you're familiar with how Hawksworth scripts, I think this is sort of 90 percent a Hawksworth script, really. And there's obviously the, the script editor in there as well. But I think this is 90 percent Hawksworth. And I do think Hawksworth's own scripts are, are some of the best in the series. The sign of four is a masterpiece for the series. But I think the run of the Redheaded League, the final problem and the empty house, uh, all of which he worked on is a pretty good run too. And it was Hawksworth who came up with the idea of introducing Moriarty in the episode before the final problem, which in the early drafts was going to be the Valley of Fear. They were gonna do a 60 minute version of the Valley of Fear. Um, and um, that would have been fascinating to see how they did it. But in the end, they dropped it and they put Redheaded League in instead. And Hawksworth decided that was where he was gonna bring in, in Moriarty. Um, uh, so it was Hawksworth who added the Mona Lisa plot, which obviously is borrowing from elsewhere, uh, and which infuriated Brett. Um, uh, eventually, Michael Cox and Hawksworth talked him into doing the episode, although he was really didn't want to do it at all. Um, personally, I think Brett was wrong, and I think Hawksworth was right in this instance. That sequence at the beginning really ramps up all the dangers to Holmes, and it shows that Moriarty's reach extends outside London, which is really important. Um, and I do think his later scripts, the Bruce Partington plans and the second stain are both absolutely brilliant um, episodes. So final thoughts on this. I mean, Hawksworth's work on Granada and the Conan Doyle series, I think, shows the genius of, of a dramatist at work. Hawksworth knew television and he knew what worked and he knew what didn't. He knew when to expand and when to stay true to the original. And whether that's the redheaded league or red handed, whether it's the final problem or playing with fire, he wasn't slavish to the original, except where the original was already good enough. And I think you see that ability to be both true to Conan Doyle in spirit and to make it work for television in his Granada adaptations, right down to the founding principles of the series that became the blueprint for the adventures and the return. And uh, I think both stories show what happens when you bring together the greatest storyteller of their day, Conan Doyle, with the greatest dramatist of their day, uh, John Hawksworth. And that's why I think the loss of that 67 series is frustrating, um, because I think it would tell us a lot more about how he, he approached this stuff. Uh, Hawksworth would go on to great things, but always had a, a, a sneaking fondness for this 1967 series. He actually tried to get it remade in the 70s. Um, he was in discussion with the BBC about the series as late as 1989. Uh, he actually retired in 92. Um, and he was also trying to get off a, a series of anthology stories uh, about ghost, uh, an anthology series about ghost stories at the time. And that was when he he tried to get the brown hand to adapt the brown hand again, um, which was one of his favorites. But sadly, that didn't come to pass. 
Um, but what I hope this sort of shows is that um, uh, there's huge potential in Conan Doyle's wider work for something similar, something that mashes together his wonderful creations in a kind of single universe with for a modern audience, as we've had with things like Dickens, uh, uh, Dickensia, I think it was called, and Austin Land, uh, but also Marvel Cinematic Universe. Where's the Doyle Cinematic Universe? The only challenge is really finding somebody of uh, Hawksworth's quality who can really turn that into a reality. So that's it. I've And just a final plug, I've written a book on that series, which is actually out on Saturday next week um, at the BFI, the British Film Institute. Um, and uh, uh, hopefully uh, that's going to provide a bit more detail for people who are interested in in understanding what went on um, and how that uh, and I tell a bit more about the story of, of Hawksworth and his and his interest in Conan Doyle. So there you go. Thanks a lot for listening. Thank you, Mark. That would be fascinating. Um, oh, really? Hawksworth was certainly a, a much wide and rounded character, all, all the uh, stuff he was involved in. I, you mentioned one of the early uh, ACD episodes was virtually word for word for the story. Mm. It was, how did Hawksworth get that through? Um, did they even think he was just being lazy and uh, using the <laughs> or was it he just convinced people that it was just so good it had to be go as is? <clears throat> it was in, I think it's because when he went to the ultimate ultimately this Harry Moore was the producer he was on a sort of level with him and then the Savory above them and Savory also really liked the Conan Doyle stories so so what what happened was Horsworth was kind of pushing at an open door really um and uh, uh and I think that really helped so um but also the great thing is that Bonnie McBird um talks really well on this that Conan Doyle has something she described to me as narrative drive um, that they always talk about this in Hollywood now, narrative drive, getting one character through through the story and keeping it moving all the time. And um, stories like the Croxley Master, which is the one that is probably the most word, you know, the closest word for word, has just got tons and tons of that. So I think he was quite lucky. He did get um, uh, he did get his knuckles wrapped several times for late scripts. Um, and the set departments sent furious letters saying, you know, you cannot do this. This is ridiculous. We've got three days to create, you know, two Georgian houses and a and a coach. Um, but um, on the whole, he was actually pretty diligent, pretty good. Um, he yeah. just had a few, few, few hiccups. You also mentioned that he and Michael Cox had a few disagreements. How do they get on mm. generally? Have they put their work all together? Oh. Yeah, very well. They really, they really did. And when they disagreed, it was always gentlemanly and it was professional. It was never, a, it was never arguments. It was always, you know, how could this be done better? I think, t I think they are two sides of the same coin on Granada, in that they, they really did share that vision for it. But I think it's interesting the number of times that Hawksworth and this series editor, whose name I forget at the moment, um, go back to Hawksworth time and again and sort of say. You know what would happen in this situation. Um, I have seen the the full Hawksworth notebook. It's a spiral bound A five notebook where he went through every single story in the canon, and he 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 wrote and it's and it's amazing. It's I it's the sort of thing that I did when I was eleven <laughs> to remind myself what were in the stories. And you just won't read it now and think, but he, he goes through every single one, and you can see sort of saying this is great, this wouldn't work. Um, and the thing I haven't read yet, but I know exists in the archives, is the Beryl Coronet is um, a um, a treatment, a full treatment that was done by another scriptwriter for the Beryl Coronet um, and a couple of other stories. Um, so it'd be interesting to see what happens there. Fantastic. All right. Has anybody else got any, any more questions for uh, Mark? Um, please unmute yourself and uh, fire away. You've answered everybody's questions. You know, <laughs> the presentation was very thorough. And uh, oh. yeah, I just no. wanted to say th thank you for the nostalgia <laughs> trip because um, yeah. in previous life I worked for the BBC Written Archives, so I'm familiar, with, very familiar with the files really? for that for that '67 series. So like, really? uh, yeah. So uh, oh yes, so thank God. you, thank you for the trip down memory lane. <laughs> Well, you know what? That the, the Britain archives were absolutely brilliant. It was so helpful. 
sadly one of the stories doesn't have a, a production file anymore that's it's correct i remember yeah <laughs> Yeah, but that yeah. but it but it's brilliant because you can find all sorts of detail and they kept things like receipts. That's um, right. There's receipts. There's wardrobe stuff. There's yeah. There's all sorts of stuff. Yeah, my 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 favorite one was there was a there was an insurance claim because one of the lead actors had um, burnt his burnt his uh, corduroy jacket on a candle and. <laughs> Tried to had tried to to fix it himself in studio and made a mess of it and then it had to get sent away for professional cleaning and there's a sort of indignant message from the costume department saying, um, uh, you know what if he'd have just left it alone it would have been absolutely fine <laughs> and then there's a whole furore because he says it happened on a rehearsal day and it's not a rehearsal day so he clearly he clearly was wearing it when he shouldn't have been burnt it somewhere in the pub probably and then to try to blame it on the costume department so, so there's sort of letters backwards and forwards but i love all that stuff all that the written archives are brilliant for that stuff aren't they they've got all sorts of like, yes quirks. yes <laughs> i miss it thank you I bet. thanks very much a brilliant presentation what was the chemistry like between hawksworth and Jeremy Brett, given Jeremy Brett's sort of volatile temperament, mm. how did mm. they get on together? So I was I talked to um, David Stewart Davis about this, um, and uh, he said that Hawksworth wasn't on set all that much, which is probably correct, actually. So how much direct contact they had, I don't know. But there is a letter in the Hawksworth papers which basically shows that he was a bit uncertain about whether or not to get involved with the Granada series. At that time, he actually thought it was a bit old hat. And when Michael Cox approached him, he thought, well, it's been done so many times. I mean, is it really going to, can we really do this again? Um, and then he met Jeremy Brett and he went, okay, all right, now we can do something with this. So I think, you know, Brett's role is so central to to this. I mean, you've got to be slightly careful with it. The timing of what Hawksworth says in this letter doesn't quite work. He'd already sort of sunk a lot of effort into the series. But I think it does show that he probably had doubts until the casting. And then when it came to the um, to the read-throughs, Hawksworth would be present at the read-throughs as well. But again, I've seen all for the Hawksworth series, I've seen the drafts, the earliest draft scripts the rehearsal scripts, the camera scripts. And so usually by tracking through those, you can see where they've made amendments. The camera script will usually have any changes that they've had during rehearsal, which is where any of the actor's performance will start to get reflected. Uh, and then obviously in this case, we've got the finished the finish versions. And you can see that there's not a ton, there are not a ton of changes really happening between them. So I think they must have got on, you know, there must have been a professional uh, a, a, a meeting of minds, a professional meeting of minds on on this work, as well. Right. right. Anybody else got any questions for Mark? He's got obviously knows his stuff, so far away. All right. Well, I think that's um. We've answered yeah. everybody. All of, all the little uh, question marks have all been covered. So thank you very much, Mark. It's a fantastic presentation. Oh, yeah, well done. I hope the uh, weather improves and get out and do some gardening tonight <laughs> in New York. It doesn't uh, look like it. <laughs> it's bouncing now. <laughs> right. We'll send some over your way. Yes. Yes. <laughs> as, I, as I mentioned, um, the passenger's log is uh, actually been finalised. I mentioned it got, it's actually with the printer now, so it'll be on its way to you all... Uh, but within, within a week or so. So keep an eye out for that one. That should be a pretty good issue. It's got some great stuff in it. So I thank every, everybody. I was big, big thanks to Mark, of course, for his wonderful presentation. Yeah. Thanks to Doug Jeez. Elliott, who will be doing the uh, video editing and put this on YouTube for us. And thank you to all the attendees for um, joining in. Your participation is very appreciated. And I'm sure, I hope you all enjoyed it all. And um, we'll be letting you all know when the, uh, the, the video is available on YouTube. So bye for now, and thank you again, Mark. Yeah, thanks, Mark. Thanks very bye. much. Thanks, Will. Good on you. Lovely to see you all. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Thanks, bye. Thanks, yeah.